session? So I believe it's being recorded. Um, they yes. asked they asked if that was fine, and I said I said yes. I thought it would be fine. So that is the plan. Um, I have been nominated and accepted the nomination of being the chair of this event. Um, and that means that I just basically get to briefly introduce uh, Daniel Bernardus, who will be, be talking first a little bit about John Senior and Leonardo Polo and imagining uh, sort of a meeting of the minds between these two great figures. And followed by Dan will be Emma Cohen, who has some interesting reflections on friendship for us. And then I'll, I will say a few words. And really, I think the, the, the part that we, hope, um, that we hope to save time for some good discussion afterwards. So without any further ado, I will introduce, or you already have, have met, Daniel Bernardus for his presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for, for coming. I'm really excited for this session. I just wanted to briefly say that um, my presentation is going to be a little bit on the longer side because I want to um, frame uh, our whole, our whole uh, project. Uh, then Emma, Emma's talk is gonna be a bit, a bit shorter. Um, and then, yeah, so, for, and after that, we, we can have a discussion. Um, before I start, I just want to say that uh, I'm gonna be presenting an initiative. I'm gonna the ideas behind the initiative, we're, we're very, very open to input. So that, that I think that's the first thing to say. Um, we are, we, we have an idea and if we think it's, it's, it's worthwhile to further explore it, uh, but we're really also looking for uh, for your ideas and to um, to further develop the initiative. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, there we go. Can you see? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's, it shows this PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Okay. Then I will. Um, Um, yes, there we go. Okay. Uh, does it now show the, the PowerPoint slide correctly? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, well, actually before um, I thought, my, I, I prepared my, uh, my talk for an audience um, which partly overlaps with the audience, which are people that have known, already know something about John Senior and, um, um, and haven't really met Leonardo Polo. Um, but talking to you, I found out that uh, not everybody has actually knows here knows John Senior. So I'll just say a few brief words before my, I actually start with the main thing of my talk. So John, John Senior, uh, this is from a tribute to John Senior. He was born in New York in 1923 and he grew up in Long Island. Um, he studied at Columbia and taught at Hofstra and Bard and Cornell and then made his way, way west, never to return, um, found a home at the University of Wyoming, and then moved to Kansas. Um, and the motto of that university is Ad Astra per, Asp uh, per Aspera. And he, um, so he was famous at the University of, uh, of Kansas for setting up the Integrated Humanities Program with two colleagues. And in that program, um, it, was, it became controversial because um, he, he was teaching a, a true liberal arts uh, well, a great books curriculum, uh, but through that that experience, quite a few people actually um, converted to Catholicism, and even some of them became monks. And the university looked at that with with very um, suspicious eyes, and saying, "Oh, yeah, what's what's happening here? Are these people proselytizing?" Or um, in the end, that that turned out not to be the case. It was investigated, and indeed, if you read his biography, you see why that's not the case. So he, um, but he had a, a method for uh, confronting people with reality, um, which I'll be talking about a bit more in, in my paper, which I think is very inspirational. And this method kind of as a natural consequence also led people to God. Then um, we have uh, Leonardo Polo. Um, he is a around Spanish philosopher, best known for his philosophical met method called the abandonment of the mental limit or mental limitation. And he elaborated the profound philosophical implications of that, uh, especially in, in thinking about the human being. Um, so he's a very, very complete and, and big philosopher. There's just the, the complete works have just been published in Spanish. 
I think they comprise 28 volumes. Um, and uh, just his, um, his, um, his theory of knowledge is only, uh, it's like 1500 pages, so it's, it's very extensive. But, um, I, so I won't bother you with all that, but I'll just give an introduction and, see, and show you where I think the two minds can meet. All right, this said, I'll start with the bulk of my paper, which is Revisiting Modernity for Realist Great Book Programs, John Senior meets Leonardo Polo. All right, can a Dutch Catholic realist scholar teaching at a liberal arts college be pardoned for not having heard about John Senior? Well, the fact is that I did not know about him until an American friend, Michael Monaghan, pointed him out to me. And I'm very grateful for that introduction and found Father Francis Bethel's biography of Senior very inspiring. I discovered a humanity scholar firmly rooted in realist theory of knowledge, able to translate his insights to education with great success. I'm myself a longtime poet, so seniors insistent, insistence on the poetic mode for helping people approach reality, especially struck a chord with me. I also saw a profound synergy with the insights of Spanish Catholic philosopher Leonardo Polo, whose work I've been interested in for a while. At the same time, I saw that Polo's work would have helped Senior to revisit his attitude towards modernity. It makes me smile to think how Senior and Polo can now hopefully be having a rich conversation about such topics in heaven. For this article, I will have to settle for considering what they would have discussed here on earth. Um, the, the conversation between Senior and Polo has its relevance in the here and now. On the one hand, the great heresy that John Senior reacted against so forcefully is more alive than ever. Relativism is rampant and on the rise. In this sense, his attitude rejecting modernity altogether remains understandable, because both in Senior and, those, and, those, and in those inspired by his thought. At the same time, the outright rejection of modernity is problematic because of the stark division of minds it creates. There seem to be very few bridges for those impressed by the positive sides of modernity to also appreciate the virtues of realism. If someone learns to value realism, should that person also reject modernity altogether? And I'll here take uh, one of the quotes of, uh, of Senior. I have to say, I, it's one of the more extreme ones. So I, he does, he's not always like this, but I, I just wanted to make the contrast clear. He says, behind the sifting mask of moder modernism, behind the reciprocal principles of artificiality and sensationalism is the diabolic. It goes on to explain, the perfection of non-being is the lie. Just plain nothing has a, has, has a reality. Absence in itself is not evil. It is the deliberate activity of absence that is evil. Not merely doing nothing, but to make meaning clear by emphasis, it is doing nothing. So doing nothing. <laughs> a lie is not a mere absence of truth, not silence, but the active assertion of what is not truth. Satan, prince of lies, is called the ape of God. The perfection of non-being is parody. Truth follows upon the existence of things. And not only truth, but falsehood as well. This is not a quarrel of words. This is not hair splitting. The universe is split. And what is more important and worth all the universe besides, each man is split. For truth is sharper than a two-edged sword, even to dividing body and soul asunder. All right. Now, Leonardo Polo, like Senior, has a great love for truth, which is at the end of this, this quote, and for also for classical thought, like Senior had. But he also has a, a, a more generous appreciation of modern thought than Senior, while also being critical. Uh, the following quote gives an impression of Polo's stance. Again, this is just one quote to, I'm just trying to tease out the, the contrast here. The moderns were trying to achieve a practical security. And I pointed out the difference between truth and certainty. But the classical root, which means the classical view of the human being, is a bit narrow because it's a bit short-sighted to consider that it's hubris to produce or to succeed in life that is arrogant to, to do so. It even compromises ethics itself because really every human act creates good or bad habits. But insofar as the classical root, the classical view of the human being is valid with respect to the modern one, it has to be said that producing is an act. If it is a human act, it will also lead to the perfection of human beings. 
That is not very clear among the classics. Okay, I will go further into the thought behind this quote later on in the talk. What I would like to focus on the, for now is that there's really different attitudes towards modernity uh, between the two thinkers. So for Polo, the fact that modernity found, um, uh, the, the truth that modernity found was more often than not mingled also with error, often also serious error, would not deter him from engaging in dialogue with the moderns. Now, Senior, I have to say, also recognizes this approach. He says, the church has never discouraged the study of other theologians, not even her of heretics, since in their very errors, they've twisted some truth, which might, might have never been so, seen so clearly if they hadn't. Now, Senior, with Catholic tradition, does not recommend such a learning process to everyone. For students starting out on their journey into literature, philosophy, and life, like the ones he taught, for them first becoming acquainted with those who fruitfully explore the fundaments of reality may actually be a better option. But at the same time, I think that we are also blessed to have philosophical masters who see, de who see deeper than most and can, who can help us guide us to the diamonds in the dung heap. Now, in my humble opinion, Leonardo Polo is such a master. In this essay, I will first discuss the synergy between Senior's proposal and uh, his didactical proposal, and then follow Polo's philosophical proposal. And I will then delve somewhat further into Polo's philosophical anthropology presented in the booklet, Freedom in Quarantine. Finally, I will present our proposal to develop a teacher training course around this booklet and our motivations for this initiative about which we can then uh, further discuss. All right, something about the synergy between Senior and Polo. What struck me most during my reading of Father Bethel's biography of Senior is the profound synergy between Senior's epistemology and a subsequent pedagogical proposal and then Polo's philosophical proposal. If understood correctly, Senior tried to if, if I understood it correctly, Senior tried to heal the imagination of students by bringing them in touch with the really real. He thought it was a good idea for school children, for instance, to do work on a farm and to go for outdoor adventures. With his university students, he would go waltzing and stargazing, as well as encouraging them, first of all, to enjoy the poetry of the text they were reading. It was this direct contact with reality that would give him the solid foundation for then later intellectual endeavors that would give the students that foundation. Um, I think this is a relevant quote, especially for this conference. He says, the great books movement of the last generation has not failed as much as fizzled, not because of any defect in the books, the best that has been thought and said in Matthew Arnold's phrase, but like good champagne in plastic bottles, they went flat. To change the figure, the seats are good, but the cultural soil has been depleted. The seminal ideas of Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, and St. Thomas thrive only in an imaginative ground saturated with fables, fairy tales, stories, rhymes, and adventures. The thousand books of Grimm, Anderson, Stevenson, Dickens, Scott, Dumas, and the rest. So, the, well, this quote focuses on the, the kind of the preparation in stories and so on, but he also really uh, encourages so people to go out and experience reality firsthand. Any realist versed in Aristotelian theory of knowledge can immediately see the logic to Senior's approach. After all, Aristotle reminds us that our concepts are formed based on sense experience, which are integrated by internal senses and only then abstracted. If the first parts of that process are hampered, we have the makings of an ill mind. Only by first fully opening our senses to reality can we cure our minds afterwards. This educational methodology is very compatible with Polo's philosophical method methodology, which is in its basis also Aristotelian. Polo's method methodological innovation is known as abandonar el limite mental, or leaving behind mental limitation. Polo conceived of this methodology when he realized the limitation inherent in conceptual knowledge. We could write endless PhD thesis on a single fly, Polo would say. Or even more profoundly, the meaning of being always goes beyond what can be captured in a single concept. We must remain open to what we can learn from reality, which is always more than we understand through our concepts. An important side note is that both Polo's and Senior's approach 
are not a disqualification of conceptual knowledge. Quite the contrary. Rather, they propose a cure for knowledge that falls ill by not being sufficiently exposed to the fullness of reality. This, le this leads to a healthy conceptual knowledge embedded in the humble attitude, very Socratic, that there's always more to know. At the same time, Polo's philosophical methodology requires justification. How can we know that our conceptual knowledge is limited? What is there in us, in us to put our concepts in their rightful place? That is a serious question, which I cannot hope to answer briefly. More so because Polo's core work on the theory of knowledge amounts to more than 1500 pages. In this work, he very carefully discusses realist epistemology in much detail and makes relevant clarifications and additions at several levels. Importantly, he makes clear that the series of steps leading from sense to concept cannot stand on its own. There are additional levels of knowledge that provide foundations. First, there is habitual knowledge that also St. Thomas talks about. Polo identifies three levels, the syndesis or I, the habit of wisdom and the habit of first principles. But secondly, there's also what he calls personal knowledge, which has both natural and supernatural instances. As I see it, the educational approach taken by senior with, insist with insistence on the really real and its emphasis, for example, on the poetic is an exercise not only in sense as senior described it, but also in habitual and personal knowledge that follows from that. We become more keenly aware of the world around us through direct experience and this activate the habit of first principles. By being exposed to classical stories, we reflect more deeply on ourselves, the synderesis, and by leaving, re reliving intimate moments with characters in stories, the conscious of our own int intimacy and that of others, the habit of wisdom and that of personal knowledge or, and personal knowledge is activated. In this way, Polo gives a detailed account of what senior experiences in his teaching. Vice versa, senior uh, supplements Polo with ideas to bring some of his core insights to practice in education. One of the core ideas to which Leonardo Polo applied his philosophy is the discipline known as philosophical anthropology, the philosophical study of the human being. One text on this topic that has been extensively used in undergraduate education at the University of Navarre, where Polo taught, is called Lo Radical y la Libertad. In it, or root and freedom. In it, Polo discusses what he considers to be the core of the classical, Christian, and modern view of the human being. He calls this core lo radical, which I have translated with the root. In other words, it is the most profound answer given in these streams of thought to the question, who are we as human beings? When due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a conference on philosophical anthropology in Amsterdam could not continue, I had time to translate this profound pedagogical text to English and write an extensive introduction to it for students with little philosophical background. Given the important role that the theme of freedom takes in this text, we published the translation and approximately equally long introduction together under the title Freedom in Quarantine. When sharing this booklet with my colleague and friend Michael Monihan at the Heights, he soon realized its potential to strengthen the connection of their realist, their realist curriculum to modern thought. To understand that potential, let me briefly introduce the different human roots presented in Freedom in Quarantine. Chronologically, the first root is the classical root. The this represents the most important insights from classical Greek philosophy in the question to the question, who we are as human beings. For Polo, the classical root is captured by the notion of the act or actuality. This profoundly realist notion can first of all refer to the act of knowing and thus link to the Aristotelian known, a notion of the human being as a rational animal, a thinking rational animal. At the same time, even though this insight was only made explicit by St. Thomas Aquinas, the notion of act can also be applied to being, the act of being. There's just a profound correspondence between being and knowledge. This is also how Polo understands Parmenides' statement that knowing and being are the same. I have it here in Greek, but I'll spare you my pronunciation. Both knowing and, and acts are, uh, both knowing and being are acts, and thus there is a fund fundamental correspondence between knowing and being. The act um, known as, the, the word is Greek is energia, is described in Aristotle's metaphysics in contrast to movement or kinesis. 
whereas a movement tends to a certain end or telos, an act contains its telos in itself. Aristotle gives the example of vision. The telos of vision is vision. There's no transition. It's reached instantaneously. Now, both being and knowledge have this property. They do not gradually come into being, but rather they actually are. This insight has fundamental consequences for understanding that the human being is not exclusively, nor most fundamentally, subject to time. Being human is not becoming human. There's something timeless to what we are and what we know. And it is the search for such timeless truths that motivated the start of philosophy. It is the love of these truths that motivates, motivates realist thought also in our days. So it's a very, very fundamental insight. All right. This is the classical root. Then we go to the Christian one. Polo also introduces the Christian root and says it is the person. What makes human beings human is the fact that we are persons. This notion received much of its content from Trinitarian and Christological theology, theology, where God is described to be one God in three persons and Christ one person in two natures. Polo does not follow the Boethian definition of personhood, which is an individual substance of rational nature, but rather points to the church fathers, especially the Cappadocian fathers like St. Gregory of Nyssa. Their notion has been further developed in medieval thought, but especially also in the 20th century. In this line of thinking, the intimate relationships, intimate relationships are especially fundamental to the person. Our personhood as human beings only becomes fully clear in an intimate relationship with God, to whom we all have a filial relationships as daughters or sons at the ontological level, at the level of being. This transcendental relationship makes every person strictly new. It is the source of creativity and unrestricted personal growth. In his transcendental anthropology books, Paul proposes and further elaborates that being a person can only be understood at an ontological level. The human being is, he uses, Spanish, uses the Spanish además, which means more or additionally. Our ontological richness is not, is not exhausted by the same type of, be, type of being as the rest of the universe, Rather, we additionally are persons. So kind of God creates something new in us, our personhood. Polo also proposes that just as the good, the true, and possibly the beautiful are transcendentals of being, so personal being has its own transcendentals. There are, uh, they are coexistence, personal freedom, personal knowledge, and personal love. This personal love to God and others is also the most full realization of personal freedom. Again, I can in this context do no more than just mention these concepts in passing in the hope they trigger interest in further study and reflection. We now come to the core point of interest for our meeting between Leonardo Polo and John Senior. How does Polo see the modern root? According to Polo, this modern root is the product. What we are as human beings is most fundamentally, according to modern thinkers, what we produce. We become ourselves, in contrast to classical thought, we become ourselves through our productive activity. Polo agrees with Senior that there's a very fundamental contradiction between the classical and modern roots, modern visions of the human being. Whereas the classical root emphasizes timeless truth, the modern root was to a certain degree elaborated in reaction and opposition to classical thought. Polo traces this opposition back to nominalism and the subsequent very negative anthropology elaborated by Luther in which human nature is irreparably corrupted. Modernity has, as a reaction, fled to the outside, focusing its attention on what it could still positively contribute if interior growth is no longer an option. It declared that our interiority is neither virtuous nor corrupted, but rather that it's indeterminate. We need to produce ourselves through the things we choose to do. As a consequence, the timeless quality of human being falls away and we become changeable subjects, fundamentally in time. Polo classifies this explanation as mythical because myths equally see the oranges of human being in a sequence of events. Still, and here he has a topic for conversation with John Senior, Polo notes that in this process of, of thought, 
modernity has stumbled upon an important characteristic of human beings that classical insights did not sufficiently take into account. Classical philosophers looked down on production. They also thought that being too successful was imprudent for it could call down the jealousy and wrath of the gods. If they had wanted to, Polo notes, the Greeks could have made great strides in the technological realm. The point is that they found that imprudent and did not want to do so. Polo disagrees with the Greeks on this point, and he agrees with the moderns insofar as they emphasize that human productivity is a valid expression of human freedom. The modern emphasis on creativity and production highlight human capacities that the Greeks should have valued more highly. Senior is right to, senior is right to point out though, that the uses of these products should be done wisely, so as not to make us slaves of our own products. And this modern slavery is currently a big problem. I think Polo would have agreed to that. Now, even more than identif sorry, even more than identifying the three roots and discussing them, Polo proposes a synthesis in which the notion, notion of person is most properly the root, the most fundamental thing about us human beings. But both classical and modern insights help to shed light on very important aspects of human existence. We need to cultivate love of truth, like the classics said, but we need to also value how our personal creative contribution to the production process can be a loving gift to other people and to society at large. In this way, our personal love of God and others can be understood to motivate both our theoretical and our practical activity, which in turn become adequately ordered and directed. All right, now, something about the teacher training course. I just want to say that, uh, to clarify, this is not something we're undertaking in the context of Amsterdam University College where both Emmy and I work. We, we do this as a private initiative. So this is something we're, we're doing together um, um, out of love <laughs> to contribute to society. Um, a group of colleagues and I are currently uh, friends, also colleagues and friends, are currently developing a teacher training course to suggest how the core insights from the meeting between Senior and Polo could be applied in, a, in great books programs. The title of the course will be Know Thyself. So what I'm saying now is what we currently have in mind. Again, we, we, we'd love to talk to you about it and maybe you have better ideas. Um, the course will be titled Know Thyself and it will have, the idea is that we'll have four modules, one on each route and a final one on the synthesis. Each module will consist of eight classes of which two introduce the route and six are applications to the fields of knowledge, ethics, freedom, society, health, and motivation and mentality. The idea is that each um, class will suggest core text to read about the topic at hand and contain a brief introduction video uh, that situates important passages in the overall course, course narratives. So these are expl explanations videos for the teachers, as well as suggesting didactical exercises that can help students experience the main, so help them experience, that's important, the main insights from the class. At the end of the, each course, there will be room for the students to exercise their creativity as well. The course is therefore similar to most great book programs in that it fo focuses on core texts. It's also dissimilar in that sometimes entire texts are read, but sometimes only selected fragments. This adaptation is necessary to bring across specific philosophical points that are important to the comprehension of the overall synthesis. In this, we allow for the guidance of Leonardo, Leonardo Polo in selecting the texts. It is also dissimilar in that it suggests didactical exercises aimed at activating sense, as John Senior would say, or in Polo's words, habitual and personal knowledge. In true liberal arts style, the materials are meant to suggest and inspire the teacher not to oblige. Before I finish, I would like to note that in our days, John Senior and his followers are not alone in criticizing modernity. The whole postmodern movement also reacts against modernity and indeed, Polo finds that their criticism of modernity, for example, of the presumed sufficiency of scientific knowledge is actually helpful. Of course, the direction postmodernity takes in its reaction is not a return to the classical root, uh, classical love of truth. However, postmodernity does tend to emphasize the personal. With Senior, we can say that it, that it is in dire need also of a reappreciation of the really real. It is my hope that the meeting of John Senior and Leonardo Polo will eventually 
not only provide a bridge toward realism for those with modern inclinations, but also for their postmodern critics. Now, this article has, despite the best of intentions, only been a meeting between the ideas of John Senior and Leonardo Polo. We can only guess how the conversation would have developed had they met and become friends. If they are right, then such a meeting would have certainly have been richer than anything written here, with the intellectual sparks illuminating their minds, born, born from the warm love uh, of truth that they carry in their hearts. I can only express the hope that such conversations can ensue between the students and followers of both thinkers so that they can mutually enrich themselves and hopefully one day join a conversation between Senior and Polo in heaven. That was it. That was great, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Absolutely. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn over the platform to Emma Cohen, who has some reflections um, on friendship. Great, thank you. Um, yes, my paper is going to be about Leonardo Polo on friendship and self-knowledge. And um, uh, I got to, uh, I'm, I'm relatively new to Leonardo Polo. Uh, it's because Dan and I are colleagues in Amsterdam. And um, I think it was a few months ago that he gave me the, his book, his translation of um, one of the essays of Leonardo Polo and with a really nice uh, introduction. And uh, I believe I read it, uh, I read it in February. And then also I was working on the, the book that will appear in, in August and that's based on the, on the, well, not quite proceedings, but on papers that were presented at the um, European Core Text Conference in, in Spain in 2019. In the end, we ended up selecting seven papers, a bit more actually, and they will be published with uh, Routledge uh, Press in, uh, in August, hopefully it should be available. Anyway, there was one chapter there uh, on friendship um, and that got me really thinking, friendship and self-knowledge, and that really got me thinking on that topic. And then I read um, Dan's book and then it all kind of came together, but I'm relatively new to Polo. So um, uh, in case there are other Polo experts besides Michael and Dan, then please, uh, Feel free to comment on the paper. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and so that you can read along, that might be helpful. Um, Leonardo Polo on friendship and self-knowledge. In this paper, I will first elaborate on the significance of friendship uh, to self-knowledge in the classical tradition. Uh, I will then discuss how Polo integrates the classical and Christian roots in his theory of self-knowledge. Uh, and I close by providing a few, few reflections about which core text could be used in a teacher training course for which Polo's philosophy provides the framework. What does it mean to know oneself? In our times, we seem obsessed with ourselves in terms of our identity. We seem to be looking for a deeper layer in ourselves that makes oneself unique. One's identity is viewed as one's authentic self. In the classical tradition, in contrast, self-knowledge did not mean uncovering one's authentic self. Classical philosophers such as Socrates viewed self-knowledge as meaning that one understands who one is as a human being, which comes with an awareness of one's human limitations. The Delphic maxims inscribed on the temple of Apollo at Delphi are to know thyself, nothing to access, and hubris brings ruin. The classical understanding of knowing oneself implied understanding oneself uh, as part of a larger whole. We see this clearly when Socrates in Plato's Apology realizes by means of reflection and questioning others that real wisdom is the property of the God and that in respect to wisdom, he, Socrates, is really worthless. This indicates a clear sense of humility and an awareness of one's limitations. Furthermore, it indicates an awareness of where one stands in the overall scheme of things that constitutes the cosmos and includes the divine. The Greek cosmos, which indicates order as well as universe, is a harmonious whole that is ordered by means of mathematical proportions originating from a divine mind, or nous. 
In a sense, knowing oneself means knowing one's place in the universe. One achieves Socratic self-knowledge by means of self-reflection. However, self-reflection does not suffice. Socrates reaches self-awareness by means of his conversations with his fellow Athenians. Friendship or philia plays an important role for the ancient Greeks when it comes to self-knowledge. We see this we see the relationship between friends enacted in several Plato's dialogues, such as the Carmides. For example, when Carmides blushes as he hesitates to answer the question whether he has a temperate soul, and this only makes him more beautiful to Socrates. Blushing indicates a modesty appropriate to, to Carmides' age, a sense of shame at the thought of transgressing boundaries, and shows an emotional awareness of, a certain, of certain limits and a hesitation to transgress these limits. This self-awareness is revealed by the conversation between Socrates and Carmides as friends. For the ancients, therefore, friendship operates as a kind of mirror to oneself. And this is essential also to Aristotle's understanding of character friendship. In character friendship, when two people love one another on account of their character, there's a kind of soulmateship in the sense of being related to his friend as he is to himself, since the friend is another self. This kind of friendship is based on seeing the friend as another self, that is, seeing one's own character reflected in one's friend's character. The reflection of one's character promotes self-knowledge. Character friendship is based on the love that one has for the other as a reflection of oneself. Aristotle argues that character friendship is a kind of self-love. He is uh, he is his own he is his own best friend and therefore ought to love himself best. This may seem egocentric, but Aristotle means that in terms of character friendship, one is a friend to oneself by loving the rational principle in oneself, that is the best and most noble part of oneself. A good man should love himself, whereas a wicked man should not. Someone should, should love the, the good part of oneself. We see here more clearly how we see here more clearly how the classical Aristotelian conception of the connection between friendship and self-knowledge is both a moral and a psychological one. Just as two friends love the other on account of their character, so a person of character loves oneself on account of what is good in oneself. Character friendship is important because, like a mirror, it reflects the best, i.e., the most rational part in us. The Spanish philosopher Leonardo Polo adds another dimension to this conception of self-knowledge. Polo argues that the Christian tradition, Polo writes about the Christian root, provides the fullest notion of the self by building on and superseding the classical notion. According to Polo, beyond the, mor beyond the moral and psychological core of the self lies the anthropological core of the self as a transcendent subject. Polo clarifies this conception of the self as transcendent subject and in particular outlines how one may uncover this deeper self in friendship. In line with Aristotle, Polo views living as a teleological act. By living and developing the virtues, a person develops one's telos or purpose. However, Polo argues that living is not only that free theological act, but rather living is destining oneself. A life rooted in the Christian awareness that oneself is created by God consists of developing oneself by means of transcending oneself. In self-transcendence, Polo argues, the, the person experiences genuine freedom. This is a freedom in which the development of oneself is a pure beginning that does not depend on anything. It depends only on God. Polo calls this new beginning the transcendental anthropological root. This metaphysical root goes deeper than the psychological root. If, as Polo argues, a person's development on the most fundamental level does not depend on anything but God, then one may wonder whether friendship plays a role in developing self-knowledge on the anthropological level. However, Polo argues that our deepest personhood can only manifest itself in intersubjective relationships. The person can only be maintained with respect to the other person. Polo's argument ensues from the Christian conception of God as both himself and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the theological thinking, God as part of the Trinity can be understood 
yeah, or is understood as a person. A human person created in the image of God can only be a person in relationship to others. A person, Polo states, can try to isolate themselves, but by doing so, they are in contradiction with themselves. They deny their personal being. If persons were autonomous, they would not be anyone. They would be an absolute misfortune. Thus, friendship has the, mirror, uh, has the function of a mirror. It may uncover oneself beyond the psychological level to the extent that a friend recognizes the other for a person who is destined in a certain way by God. This knowledge of who one is goes to the deepest core of a person. We may say that this knowledge is existential in character. Friendship reveals that while one's friend is another self, the friend is at the same time another self in the sense of existential otherness. In other words, in friendship, one learns that one is a unique being. There's always something unique and irreducible in a person that is more than a person's psychological manifestations and that may remain a mystery. Nietzsche and Derrida recognized this, so postmodern philosophers, and pointed to the conclusion that an ontological estrangement exists between friends. Ultimately, they argued, one can never really know the other. Polo, however, argues that they mistakenly separate the person from one's transcendental root. And he concludes that the person is ultimately a unique being that reveals herself in an intersubjective relationship, even if the mystery remains. A final point provided by Polo is that the uniqueness of the person reveals itself specifically in a relationship characterized by fidelity. As a relationship between friends, as the relationship between friends deepens and becomes more loving, the uniqueness of a person reveals itself more fully. A long and good marriage, for example, involves friendship between the spouses in the context of which the unique being of each spouse is fully revealed, is revealed more fully than in any other kind of relationship, even though one spouse may never completely know the other perfectly. This kind of self-knowledge brought about by close and lasting friendship is central for character formation since it provides a personal self-awareness necessary for freedom and therefore for moral growth. Well, that's a mouthful, but now as we turn to the teacher training course based on Polo's framework of the classical Christian and modern route, um, which my colleague Dan has already um, explained and alluded to, which core texts are appropriate for a discussion of self-knowledge and friendship and the dimension that Polo brings out? In other words, when developing our teacher training course, which core text may we be able to recommend to teachers who seek to discuss the theme with their students? Um, in his writings on self-knowledge, Polo references Aquinas, uh, Genesis, and Paul's letters to the Col Colossians. Um, I, what comes to mind is uh, what comes to my mind is Augustine's Confessions, which Augustine. Uh, which includes Augustine's reflection on and, and dialogue with friends and a powerful inner dialogue, both of which lead up to knowledge of the transcendent self, are very much open to further suggestions. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you, Dan. Um, I just wanted to say a, a, a couple brief words. Uh, I work not at the university level, but at the, the high school level. I am the head of the upper school at the Heights School in Potomac, Maryland. We are um, an all boys school here in the close to Washington, DC, close to our nation's capital. Um, and we've been considered by some people to be an example of a classical education school before um, the classical education movement really got started in the United States, which I think as, as many of you know, it's, it's uh, a very um, uh, young and, and vigorous movement in education here in the United States. And yet in some ways, we've always been a little bit uncomfortable with being just labeled as a, as a classical school. Uh, so at the Heights, we have a distinct curriculum that we're, we're very proud of. We go back and we read a lot of the primary source texts. The students who come into our high school in the freshman year 
one of the hallmarks of their experience is they study in the freshman core program where English and history are taught together by the same teacher who also is a personal mentor to each student. And the history covers in this class from essentially from Cicero, uh, the transition from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, all the way up to Napoleon. And they read literature that corresponds to this same period as well. So they'll read Virgil's The Aeneid, um, Beowulf, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Shakespeare's Henry V, Robinson Crusoe, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and end with uh, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And we have similar programs for other years. In the sophomore year, the shift is more to the American scene as the, the, the core classes in English and history really explore the roots of the American um, experience and all the way up into contemporary times. Um, one of our, our hallmark courses has been uh, the seniors will take a class called History of Western Thought, where after having studied uh, a lot of, of these aspects of our tradition, they will go back in their senior year in high school and read the works of the, the great works from our tradition, Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and Seneca, um, Augustine and Aquinas. And our challenge has always been, we know we need to do a better job with the moderns. How do we properly introduce our students to the moderns? And we've made some attempts um, in this, this history of Western thought class. I remember our teachers a while back were, were doing uh, Descartes' discourse on method and they, uh, the students um, would, would respond to it. And some of the teachers commented to me that, that they were so surprised that the students seem to have already imbibed this mindset into the way they think about reality. And that, that, that was an interesting exercise for them. But a while back, uh, as I started to become friends with, with Dan, he did introduce me a bit to Leonardo Polo. And I, I know Emma mentioned this book. I'd also like to strongly uh, recommend this book, Freedom in Quarantine, where there's a great introduction to the text that was mentioned before, The Root in Freedom, um, which is a lecture that Polo gave, or a series of lectures uh, in, at the Pan American University in Mexico, I believe, if, if, that's, if that's correct. Um, and through thinking about this, and through many other people here at the Heights who've also read this now and have been thinking about it, we've really seen a, uh, it's, it's been a little bit eye-opening to us in recognizing that you know, we never wanted the students to go through and, and fall in love with classical wisdom and then correspondingly uh, feel out of place in the world around them. We wanted them to fall in love with classical wisdom and live a well-integrated life where they understand the legitimate concerns and, the, and what's good in, in modern thought and be able to pull all that together. And, that would help them to be the students who will go out and set fire to the earth to really uh, uh, be able to be transformative and, and help the culture that we uh, are, are in right now. And being able to understand that we can take that great realism, um, which is also very much embodied in a figure like John Senior, um, you know, a while back at a faculty workshop, we spent some time talking about Senor and that very book that 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 Dan showed, uh, Father Bethel's biography of Senior, which does a very nice job, and the the insight that he had of the importance of the really real, that that these fundamental great insights are compatible with an openness to the modern world, and an openness which is it really has the possibility of um, working with this environment that we find ourselves in where intellectual and ethical tribalism as well as political tribalism are so, are so present. Uh, but there is a chance to try to work towards a new synthesis. And we very much want this for our students. And so this has been a great exercise for us in starting to discover the contribution that Leonardo Polo makes to be able to look closely at what we do and the type of education that, that we provide um, so with that, what I wanted to do is 
open this up for a discussion where people are able to comment, ask questions, um, and that we can get to know our, each other a little bit better. So feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead um, and ask. You don't have to be recognized to speak. Just uh, feel free to, to chime in. Before uh, jumping in uh, with a question and, and allowing everybody else to jump in first, may I point out that Freedom in Quarantine is available in electronic format. I bought it while we were talking. I haven't read it yet, um, but uh, I'm uh, very open to electronic books and you may find it useful to uh, buy it that way. Um, my question is that um, my understanding of, of Senior and uh, perhaps of Polo is that they are, um, they come from a Catholic background. My question is, how do you deal with students who do not come from a Catholic background, uh, Protestant or secular, uh, or some other religious tradition? Or is that a problem that you've uh, addressed? Thank you. Should I take that, uh, Michael? Uh, that would be fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I could just briefly at the Heights, we have the majority of our students are Catholic, but many of them are, are not and they fit in very well. Um, we have some Protestant families that are very closely mission aligned with, with what we do. And um, even in the past, people from other faith traditions as well, so. Thank you. Yeah, may I add that? Um, yeah, what shall I say? I, I, I see this as a, um, this project as, a, as kind of a, a stepping stone. Um, I, I'm kind of directing myself first, uh, or at least my idea is to first direct the initiative towards um, uh, Christ, Catholic or Christian schools. Um, also to, well, to kind of to build a group of friends to, <laughs> to, to learn together, to, to see how this can be relevant. I think that already there we'll, we'll encounter a lot of We'll learn a lot there from um, kind of uh, how to how to also engage with with people who are not uh, with this particular material because there, there are many people of course that are not not religious there. I think Paulo. Is, I mean, he's a philosopher, so he, he doesn't he, he doesn't start from revelation. He starts even though, of course, he's very Christian Christian inspired. Um, so I, I, I yeah, and I I do really think that he will. Uh, provide a, a, a bridge towards um, yeah to towards a deeper view of the human being which which can help people of, of all uh, faiths but it, I think it's also a bit of a development especially pedagogically I think it, 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 it's good to take several steps um, I also have to mention by the way if, if there's any uh, any Protestants among you that, that Polo is, is in this book, particular booklet quite critical of Luther, <laughs> specifically his anthropology. So uh, just, just a trigger warning, basically. <laughs> but okay, yeah. Thank you both. I just wanted to mention something really quick. Um, I've always homeschooled my children and so um, over here in Vancouver, Washington, I actually um, work at a nonprofit. So I'll teach classes there for other homeschooled children. And it's a very Christian um, group that we have over there. And so, but as a Catholic, what I have found interesting is it's harder for my kids um, raised Catholic to fit into a non-Catholic Christian based school than it is for kids that are coming from non-Catholic um, raising to fit into a Catholic one. And I don't know why that is, but as Catholics, we are very, um, I don't want to use the word prideful, but very confident, but very confident in our understanding of things. And I think that that comes off sometimes a little bit more like know-it-alls. I, I know that sounds weird, but this is just from, from my perspective of things. And to people that don't understand the, the uh, faith. And I think that that's kind of just an interesting thing that I, I've been playing with as a parent myself lately is that that is, it's surprising, but it's there, so. Great, thank you very much. 
yes, and your your comment does speak to the need that um, the need for us to be very much open to to people, open to friendship with people, and not leading with um, in an unnatural way with pretending that we have all the answers. I mean, each person uh, to it, it, one of the striking insights that was so clear to me as I was reading through some of Polo's thoughts that each person has a tremendous unique dignity that is unrepeatable, that um, each person is a unique masterpiece. Um, I mean, fundamentally, we believe that each person has been uniquely crafted by God and that, you know, just to, to stand before this person in their, in their, their freedom, their, their dignity um, with uh, respect and not to come off as a, a know-it-all, yes, is, is very important. Yeah, I think it's not, it's, it's weird because it's not something that I think that Catholics do. I think that, I mean, all the Catholics that I know are very, very open to other um, denominations. The, the idea though, is that there's an assumption there. there. There's an assumption on Catholics that Catholics know everything. And, and I know that, I don't know if you guys have ran into this and I don't know, but it is there. And so that's kind of what I'm referring to is that um, it's really hard to share your own views as a Catholic, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have experienced it, but I've had a lot of talks this last week with my kids about it. So that's why I'm bringing it up. So. Thank May you. I observe that um, I was raised as a lukewarm Methodist and then became indifferent for 40 years. Um, I converted to Catholicism late in middle age and uh, having been around Protestants as a young man and child, um, there is a, a real lack of understanding of the church and of their thinking and some hostility. Uh, I, I've also, as Dan knows, been reading Francis recently, and uh, he is an expert at reaching a cross-cultural divide to other people. And I would encourage you to read his uh, church documents, especially um, Fratelli Tutti and um, Evangelum Gaudium. Um, at least that's what I've read recently. So. Uh, that might be useful in, in reaching out to people who don't understand or are hostile to the, uh, the church. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for these comments. I, I'm, I, yeah, I, I've read these documents with a lot of joy. They're, they're very beautiful. But I think we, we need to find ways in practice to, to overcome this, um, yeah, this sentiment. Um, and, and that just needs, I think, also a lot of tact. Um, but I, I do agree with Michael that, that actually Polo's methodology is all about this. So all about not being kind of, it also can also help people to, to, to re recognize their own concepts and the, the limitations of them. That's what it, this whole methodology is about. So if we can bring that across also to, to believers and non-believers, it would be great. But, yeah. I, I would be eager to hear more about uh, the subject of friendship in this uh, context and uh, how the, the course um, will uh, address that. And also what, what, what the, your expectations are for uh, reactions of students. I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure I know what students today think about friendship. It's a subject that um, I think it's not discussed a lot um, in certainly in philosophical circles at present. So um, I'd like to hear from more. And I know Emma had quite a bit to say on that subject, but I'm happy to hear from anybody who uh, can inform me. Emma, please. Sure. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for being here. It's good to see you uh, online, at least. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, first, in general, I think uh, I'm a political theorist and uh, in, I do ancient uh, political thought. So there's obviously uh, Aristotle is very clear and very aware of the importance of friendship uh, for an ethical life. And uh, I think I think you see it very clearly in the, the Platonic dialogues as well. There's always, I think with Socrates, always a sense, even though he's he's harsh or sharp or, but yeah, there's always an aura of, of, of generosity there as well. Um, maybe when he butts heads with uh, Calicles, it, it gets really rough, but 
I think in the end, or, or for example, in the in the Republic, uh, yeah. th that sense of friendship or care is also there. Yes. So I think, yeah, I th and so that's also why I'm interested in the topic because I think for the ancients it was such an important topic, um, not just in terms of pleasure but also in terms of, uh, yeah, being someone um, um, uh, living a good life basically. <laughs> Yes, very much. Um, so, uh, and in modern thought, uh, that 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 disappears somewhat. I think, in part, through the individualism of of the Enlightenment, and uh, then we have sort of a romantic reaction to that. But then, friendship also becomes um, problematized, maybe in a way, because there's so much emphasis on on one's uniqueness that, that it's a little bit what what. My paper said very uh, shortly about Nietzsche and Derrida that there's that we're so unique that we can not really know one another, and then friendship also becomes complicated. Um, so, uh, I, but I think it's a great topic. Um, I've uh, done a little bit of work with one of my students on. Uh, for a time, I thought would it would it be nice to look at intellectual friendship uh, in the previous century? So, so to take for example, well. My student wanted to look at Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. <laughs> My students are, are, are yeah, I, I have, we have very overall students who, who love the, yeah, romantic philosophy and, and, and sort of the postmodern and, well, the more progressive uh, philosophers. And um, uh, so we started a project and I think it was very nice. Um, uh, although for me at some point it became a bit more too a bit too historical so and you know i'm a philosopher and i, I want to just talk about ideas um yeah so so that uh and then that got me to polo as well there i'm not sure yet if i'm really the expert to talk um and it's but it's a topic i'd like to explore more uh and to see how much because he I think Leonardo Polo, the interesting thing is he appreciates all three roots, not just the Christian or not just the Christian, the classic, but, but all three, also the modern. And uh, so I would like to see more what he takes from the classical root in, in respect to friendship and its value. Uh, or if that friendship somehow also gets um, not, not compromised, but at least... Um, well, I'm not sure yet, basically, but uh, I'd like to explore it further. <laughs> well, that that reassures uh, me that you know my ignorance is not is not you know is not unique. Uh, but it seems to me something very important, and uh, I'm really delighted to hear that that's going to be one of the uh, one of the foci of this course. If, if I could chime in here, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, turning turning from maybe. Uh, philosophic ideas on friendship to kind of their applicability within uh, the, uh, training in the classics or in, in the liberal arts. Um, and I'm sure Michael can uh, can confirm this. I mean, I, I think friendship plays a key role in the understanding uh, any deep idea that we get from reading classical text. It, it needs to form a pillar of our engagement with um, uh, deep ideas, and uh, you know, I, I um, er, y yesterday I presented two days ago I presented a paper on uh, John Henry Newman, and one of the, in one of the things he says is in, in his idea of the university is that um, you can't really have a university without a community of friends. Uh, you can't pursue the idea of uh, knowledge for its own sake or or pursue truth without a, a core of friends, um, without uh, friends being able to bounce ideas off each other. Our, our human nature is flawed. And so we need to have friends that um, point out where our thinking is deficient. And, um, and that, that can get much further than just you know, having someone sit down by himself and read uh, the classics by himself and, you know, just kind of think things on his own or just listen to a lecture. I, I think that it's it, the, uh, you know, the personal in intellectual transformation, the formation of true uh, intellectual habit really comes from being able to uh, form 
uh, an intellectual community. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's funny thinking about this in the context of a pandemic. I would, I would say in, you know, or in quarantine, I don't know how possible liberal education is <laughs> in the context of, of a quarantine. If you can't actually have that community, um, you know, I'd say that there's something essential missing there. Um, and so, and, and I really think that, you know, being able to, to share together, to have experiences together can form, um, form an essential part of all that. Yeah, thank you, thank you Jose. I, I think it's also a, a challenge for our, uh, for our course. We, we're of course trying to bring teachers together um, and, and kind of inspire the teachers. Of course, they will have their local communities but I think we need to carefully think about how to, how to also form a community of teachers somehow, uh, maybe through organizing a, a conference to, to exchange experiences or um, some meeting or or not. I don't know. I think this will will have to be somewhat <laughs> technology facilitated, even though maybe we can do sometimes uh, I don't know conference at the heights or something. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it seems to me this is, as I said, I, I really appreciate your your comments and, and your your uh, you know your your eagerness to to deal with this subject. Um, it, it 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 seems to me that so much that goes on in philosophy these days, and these days have been for quite a long time, including Sartre and Beauvoir. Uh, I have to say, uh, does not prioritize friendship as far as I can see. I, th I think Em is quite right. You go back to Plato and Aristotle; it's very central. Um, it uh, seems to be inseparable from the fabric of of, uh, of, of inquiry uh, at that time. But I, I don't see that happening now. It may just be because I I haven't read the right people. And, and, and indeed, uh, you know, Polo and Senior are not people that I know. Uh, so maybe I just need to uh, acquaint myself with other thinkers. But um, you know, among analytic philosophers, uh, who, whom I do read uh, a great deal of, uh, I don't see much attention to this. Thank you. May, may I uh, ask um, Joseph, because I think among all the people here, I think you know John Senior quite well, right? Or, or am I? Uh, no, I do not. I don't oh, know don't. him at all. <laughs> oh, really? Um, is, there, is there anyone here who 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 is uh, more acquainted with John Senior? Well, anyway, Joseph, I, I would really like to have your 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 view on on what has been said so far with and Greg, and Greg as well. Uh, well, um, I, I, I don't. I don't know uh, Leonardo Polo or John Senior. This is actually my first uh, exposure to them. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what to say. I'm just okay, sort of well, taking. Sorry for taking putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I was struck by one thing you said, Dan, and maybe I misunderstood you. You were talking about. I think it was. Um, Senior, you were, or was it? Um, it was this idea, or maybe it was Polo. The um, the idea that God, the the transcendent relationship with God, is not um, based on anything. It's sort of de novo. Uh, I'm not sure I'm putting it right, but the uh, when I heard that, I thought of the Thomistic doctrine that grace always presupposes on and builds and completes nature. And, and it almost seemed like you were contradicting that principle, um, or, or um, perhaps it was um, Polo who was contradicting it. But maybe I misunderstood you there. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I don't, I don't, ha I, I don't think he 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 would deny that principle. Um, I think it is. Yeah, so th for this, I, I'd really have to think through his philosophical anthropology more, more deeply to give a good answer to that. Uh, I myself, I'm working towards a PhD in, in Leonardo Polo, uh, but I'm, I'm still in the process of studying his core works, um, which again are pretty volu voluminous. <laughs> so um, this is a question that I, I hope to be able to answer within uh, one or two years from now. 
<laughs> I, the other thing, I, I was very intrigued by John Senior's idea that it's not enough to read books with your students, you have to in, get them directly engaged with yeah. reality. So uh, working on a farm, or not just reading about the stars, but going out at, at night and looking at the stars. I thought that was a very uh, yeah. profound insight, I think, as a matter of pedagogy. I wish I knew how to do that better myself. Um, too often, we think the whole point of education is to immerse ourselves in cultural <clears throat> products, and we forget that the, the whole the point is to, is to uh, deepen our insight into reality and our grasp on reality and to broaden our understanding of reality. It's not about learning ideas in books or neat, nifty theories in, in books. I thought that was a very good insight and very, very I, I think this, this is absolutely the core of his contribution. And I think it's, it's incredibly valuable. It's what I, what I learned from, from him. I think, by the way, it's also the, now that I think of it, the answer to the question, you know, how, how can we make sure that we don't come across as know-it-all Catholics? <laughs> well, by, by, uh, by not being too Catholic about it, I don't. I don't think Senior was. Uh, he was. He was very real about it. So, and this is, I think, is what what what's so so beautiful about him. So he he just helped people to look. If we let's first see reality, experience reality, and then we're gonna think about that. And that that means that everything you read suddenly becomes relevant. You know. It's all about it's all about the real. It's all about about you, about other people, about our relationships. Or so the 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 whole the classics come in a in a completely different light, and they start to come to life. They start to be enjoyed. They start to be uh, they start to be lived. And and that that's that's the that's the death of relativism. Because that means that you are, you know, you're ingrained in reality. And, and that's what the classics and, and the great text try to do to, to really help us appreciate that. So that for me also was mind blowing. And that, that's what I really appreciated in senior. Um, I wanted, if I may say something, Please. but not being a philosopher. So I'm not dealing with reality, but with fiction because I work in the field of comparative literature. And I wanted to say uh, two remarks to one of the question of, uh, the presence of friendship in literary texts, not in philosophical texts, in, in modern times or in contemporary times. And the other one, how to integrate modern uh, issues in, in this uh, uh, effort uh, on great texts and so on. No? Well, friendship, in, in fact, if you look at the at modern um, literature from the 16th till the end of the 19th century, it is really centered on the story of an individual. Yes, looking to an individual and to the problems of the individual and relationship is something complex. It's something which uh, happens with a lot of problems and ends tragically and, and, and so on and so on. In narrative, poetry, theater are a bit different. No? But after the collapse of this individual center literature at the end of the 19th century, there you can evoke uh, uh, writers like Pirandello, like Unamuno, but also Thomas Mann and, and Antonio Kröger, or also uh, Joseph Conrad, uh, Joseph Conrad, not Joseph Conrad, uh, Joseph Holt in uh, Radetzky Marsh and, and so on. You, you see there the end of, evolution, of an evolution with a collapse. So the, 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 the individual is coming to, to, an, to an end in this utopian dream of self-realization. Well, this is a little bit too simplified, but, but then mostly in, in the surroundings of World War II, there are some books rediscovering friendship rediscovering relation. One of them I was talking yesterday in the, in the session about this is obviously The Little Prince of Saint-Exupéry. It's, it's, it's a guide how to establish relations, how to create friendship. But for example, another one, uh, I have to look to my, to my uh, uh, Fred Ullmann, The Wiedergefundene Freund, or uh, 
Reconciliation or something like this. Another incredible uh, rich book on friendship. Uh, in, in, well, uh, and, and there are several others that are trying to go out from this darkness. Huh? And this could be the second remark. Sometimes, and this is, I think, a danger in, in this uh, views of great books, and cortex, and so on. You have to look to the evolution. Sometimes uh, things are clear, not in one text, but in how a topic evolves uh, during sometimes um, centuries in very significant uh, books. I did it in several times in a, in a course on modern literature showing exactly this, you know, the evolution of the view of the individual in uh, narratives, in novels, you know, from the from Quixote, uh, which seems to be the first modern novel, to the uh, 20th and 21st century. So there, of course, it, it, it's a bit more complex, yes, because uh, you have to deal with several texts and you have to choose very well the texts, yes. Um, but but it is possible no? to to see how topics evolve, also coming from from classic texts, no? and how sometimes the abandoning of some classic Christian views is uh, is leading to a very complex uh, situation, sometimes also to disasters. Yes. Um, this is what I wanted to say, if it's uh, useful. I have some materials on, on it. And, uh, if you ask uh, for them uh, via email, I can send some, some uh, things I did in, when being at the University of Navarra and, and after that now here in, in, in Peru, in, in Lima. But uh, maybe it's useful. Thank you so much. It certainly is. Uh, thank you for the suggestions for the text, but also the the idea of, of, of looking at development in, in, in text, I think it's something we should certainly think about and look at more deeply. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank yeah. you so much. And are you are at, uh, in Peru or in Navarra? <laughs> no, I'm in Peru, the oh, University Peru. Okay. Of, of Piura, living in, uh, in Lima, yes. Okay. Mm. okay. Thank you. Stephanie, you seem to want to say something. I have a couple comments, but I know you explicitly called in Greg, so perhaps uh, if he wants to jump in, we should- Steph, you go right ahead, Stephanie. So, I'll, I'll come after you. Right. Um, well, first I have a few like quick practical questions, and then I have a thought on, on friendship and a text that's useful, if not for your teacher training course, perhaps it is for anyone who's trying to um, connect students to a very modern reality, which is um, the world of business. But this course that you've created, how many teachers do you plan to uh, teach at a time and how will you recruit them and how will you deliver it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and it's something we don't have, we, we don't have the final answer to. Um, so it's something we're thinking about at, this, at, the, at the moment. Um, we, what I'm thinking now, again, open to, <laughs> is to, to have like an, an, an online platform uh, where, where teachers can go. There, there will be one short video on every, on every class in the courses we have thought of it. Um, and that is basically our input for the teachers to, to kind of, yeah, take up and, and see what they can use of that. Uh, and, and the video will be a suggestion for core texts um, an elaboration of how, the, how it relates to the overall course narrative and some didactical exercises that can help, them, help the teachers uh, relate to reality. Yeah, I remember what you've described. I'm, I'm interested in the logistics because the best planned thing can just die on the rocks if the, if the system isn't delivered well. So have you, um, have you either of you taught online before or worked on uh, taken classes in those kind of platforms? 
I, I have, but um, that's good. Yeah. I have tons of experience, or I probably more than the average bear. I wouldn't say tons. So if I can be of any service, let me know. And if you're teaching it in English, I want to take it. But in terms of the other aspects of this, um, around friendship, uh, I think an important text for people to consider just in your own reading or incorporating in this, not this class necessarily, but whatever class you're interested in on that is um, the Bhagavad Gita and the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna. And I think that's meaningful. And of course we know there are important friendships outside of the philosophical text, but like in the Iliad, etc. It's interesting that both of those have to do with war, but the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna is it's very different. And my students find it very interesting to, to contrast and, and dig in to those kind of aspects. Um, in terms of the idea of really engaging the present, and I'm so delighted to be in this session because I've had such a hard time ending my, my core text, uh, core sequence on an up note, because it's like the modern world is this scary, awful place. And I, I've i um, ended with Rachel Carson, a selection from Rachel Carson on Silent Spring and uh, the chapter, The Obligation to Endure. And I've also used, um, paired that with David Suzuki's um, The Sacred Balance, a selection from that, as well as just the intro from the, the Tao of Physics to help them connect across from the very beginning of mystic human things to, to science and that we should be thinking about ecology, entire ecologies. But even trying to leave them with that reality that we need to focus on this as our next part of, of human existence was just too depressing. So I, I know I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers by sharing with you what I end with now because you'll all just like die because it's not written by an academic or some scientist person or whatever, but I'm at Arizona State University and I work with tons of engineering and uh, medical students and all these other kinds of folks and a lot of business students. We have some of the best uh, like business and engineering schools. So I found this at a National Collegiate Honors Council. I'm in the Honors College. It's called Start Something That Matters by Blake Mykoski. And he's the person who started Tom's Shoes. And he's like one of the very first uh, thinkers on conscious capitalism. And he completely shifted the model from the Milton Friedman businesses only exist to make money and they have no responsibility to the public. And it's, I start with very natural things. So it's, I get the students to think about if we incorporate businesses and protect them like individuals, but we can't, we can't in, um, punish them the same way we punish individuals. We could also be protecting rivers and we could whatever. And the, he, if you don't know the story, he started, um, he had, had many different businesses, but then he was moved to bring uh, a one for one model into his business where for every shoe you buy, set of shoes you buy, he gives one to people. And this has inspired all kinds of one for one businesses or just the fact that these kids have to go out into reality. And like you said, um, Michael, you don't want them to, to feel out of place in the modern world. And so they're gonna go work in organizations and be the voice for all these principles we're trying to embody in them. They're gonna start their own businesses. And if they start something that matters to them, this, oddly enough, this very simple to read, very modern text, they make all kinds of connections back to all the previous texts that we've done because he talks about integrity. He talks about friendship. He talks about uh, appropriate use of resources, blah, blah, blah. So I would look into that um, for anyone that's interested. And I guess I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you for the recommendation. Yeah. Great. Thanks for mentioning the Iliad as well and the Dr. Vita. So mm -hmm. look into that. I think sometimes, Stephanie, we have to go outside, um, outside the cortex too. I mean, we just have to, you know? Um, I know that when I teach anything on friendship, 
I start with core values, have the students kind of dive into the difference between values and virtues. And then I have to give them little bits of Aristotle's ethics. I can't just give them the friendship section of Aristotle because if I did that to beginning college students or high schoolers, they'd die. So what I do is I give them clip it's and then have them explore what friendship is as a virtue on its own. And I think that once they start to do that, they start to develop it, but I have to be hands off, but I also have to put some modern things in there. Like I have to have them explore what's the difference between a friend on social media versus a friend that they've known since they were five, you know, and, and get them to explore these different friendships. Cause the thing with the modern world is we're not so full of friendships as we are acquaintances, you know? And so there's something new added that Aristotle does not approach in his ethics that we have to add in order to approach our modern students in our world today. And the thing with the great books is we have to apply them to our modern world for them to count a lot of times to our younger students because they can't connect with something that they don't, that there's no connection with. And I think that adding other sources sometimes to do that is what we need to do. And I think that that's fine too. Yeah. And to just to, to reiterate, we also follow a, a largely chronological plan in our unit. But the reason I can get this in without having too much frustration from my colleagues is because it's the very last thing I do. And it's the most modern reading I do. And I... I believe it will be 50 years from now, if it's not already considered that, a classic because he put conscious capitalism on the map. And so that's my argument to my colleagues. But I agree with you. And we've got to give them something, even if it's some current event sign of assignment or, or bringing in a little bit of news. Where, where do you see these values? I always emphasize personal and contemporary applications so they can see that these texts are living and breathing even though they're old. I have just a one brief note here and that is I did receive a message um, that is indicating that at 2.30 in just a couple minutes they're going to need to close this uh, room and yet by going to the home page and going to the mingle function people could continue conversations in that way. So I think we have another two minutes left. Sure, I mean, if I could jump in really briefly here. Uh, I, I think that uh, liberal education strives for excellence, and I think there's a lot of excellence in the modern. I don't think you can understand a lot of, I, I don't actually like the distinction between ancient and moderns generally. I, I think it can often cause more problems than it's worth. I think you can find a lot in John Locke that you can also find in Aristotle, or you can't really understand, I mean, and you can make a lot of mixed between Nietzsche and Aristotle even. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that it, it's really important to uh, take what they have uh, at, to offer at face value um, because yeah, we can't really understand the modern world without reading them. And, and because they are excellent in themselves. I think I'll, I'll be joining the mingle thing for a little bit. So if anyone wants to continue the conversation, I'd be really happy to. But uh... okay, Michael, can you say how to get to the mingle function? Uh, the note indicates going to the to the home page for the conference. Then right off to the side, there is a, a mingle kind of icon that you can click on, or at least a mingle indication that you can click on. Hmm. Very good. Uh, the bottom of the menu on the left, I think, on the homepage. The yep. left, yes. Yes, yes the fourth I, I one. Get, the uh, I, I'm, you can hear me? I don't know. I guess you can. Yeah, yeah. I want. I've, I've got to get ready for the business meeting, but uh, I do want to thank everybody, the presenters in particular, but everybody who participated in this session for a, an extremely lively and interesting experience. Thank yeah. you. Thank you thank all. Also, yeah, it was it was thank great. You thank you so much. Good to see you. And I'll be at the business meeting as well. Okay, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good.